Jesus said to his disciples, occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. Good morning, friends. My name is Matt Stone. Welcome to worship with Dunwoody United Methodist Church. I'm glad that you've joined us this morning. Today, we're looking at a passage in Luke chapter 16. This is part of our beautiful Oops series. And I got to tell you what the heading in my Bible calls this group of passages. It says, some sayings of Jesus. That's the best they could do. When they were thinking about the passages that we're going to read, the verses that we're going to read this morning, the best they could do was some sayings of Jesus. It's an interesting little collection of, uh, of verses and teachings, but it, the thread that holds them together is not exactly clear. And frankly, they say some things that make us really uncomfortable in a couple different ways. If, if we read these verses disconnected from uh, the larger context of Jesus' teaching. So this morning, we're going to take a, a big step back. Before we look at Luke 17, we're going to take a big step back and remember, for the sake of reading these verses correctly, for, for the sake of reading them faithfully, we're going to remember the larger context of Jesus' teachings, what it was that he was chasing as he taught his disciples and the people around him about how to live and how to engage in this world. So there was a time that, that somebody asked Jesus, hey, what's the most important commandment? And essentially they're saying, what's the most important thing, right? When you think about all the laws, when you think about all the things that we're supposed to do as, uh, as faithful people, as faithful people of God, what's the most important thing? And Jesus' response famously is captured in Matthew chapter 22, verses thir verse 37. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's smashing together, by the way, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, a passage that's called the Shema, together with uh, Leviticus 19, verse 18, which says, you shall love your neighbors as yourself. It turns out that this is what God has been up to since the beginning of our story. When Jesus teaches us the main thing, when Jesus says, Here's the most important commandment. He's relying on a story that God has been living out in our midst from the very beginning. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. For a lot of us, it's a passage that's relatively familiar. Perhaps it's a little too familiar, which frankly makes it all the more surprising that we somehow seem to have missed the main point of that passage. One of my favorite books is called The Art of Neighboring. You may have read it. Uh, and it tells the story of a group of local pastors in the Denver area who get together with their mayor to talk about some of the challenges that the city is facing. They want to know how they could serve the city better. And so they get together with the mayor and they, they have their laundry list of issues, right? The dilapidated housing, the at-risk kids, the, uh, the childhood hunger, the drug and alcohol abuse, uh, the, the isolated shut-ins, all right? They have this long laundry list uh, of challenges that their city is facing and they put it to their mayor, hey, how can we serve this city best? And the mayor says, you know, look, a lot of times when people identify an issue that's challenging the city, they, they do a bunch of research and then they come to some city official and they say, hey, here's a problem, you should fix it. Here's a problem, you should start a program to address that. And the mayor says something that I think is absolutely fascinating. He says, look, I, I think that, that the, the thing that we could do that would make the biggest difference, right, that would, uh, that would um, uh, eliminate or dramatically reduce all of these challenges would be if we could figure out a way to simply be a community of great neighbors. That was his solution. His solution was, look, government programs have their utility, but at some point they come to an end. He said relationships in his experience are far more effective 
because they are organic and sustainable over the long term. He said, if we could figure out how to simply be a community of great neighbors, all of these challenges would either be eliminated or dramatically reduced. That's a pretty remarkable kind of statement. And, and that conversation gave birth to the neighboring movement. I'd encourage you to go read The Art of Neighboring because it's a fascinating little read. But here's what I love about it. Well, two things that I love about it. One, uh, the simplicity of the approach is its genius. Just be a good neighbor, right? To the people who live next to you, be a good neighbor. If there is a shut-in who lives on your block, go and take care of them. Right? If there is an at-risk child that lives down the street from you, you be the solution. Don't rely on a school program. Don't rely on a government program. You, as a good neighbor, can just go down the street and mentor that child. That's the simplicity of the approach. I love it. Here's the other reason I love it. They stole it. They stole it from Jesus. Isn't this exactly what Jesus was telling us to do? When somebody asks him, what's the main thing? What's the most important thing? Didn't he just say, Love your neighbor, love God, and love your neighbor. I love that they ripped it straight from Jesus, which by the way is kind of what pastors do week in and week out. They took it right from Jesus. And so they started a movement that transformed their part of the city. This is exactly what Jesus did, right? They took it from Jesus, but it's exactly what Jesus had in mind and what the early church, I think, had in mind as well. What if when Jesus said, love your neighbor, he meant your actual physical geographic neighbor? What if he meant to love the people who live around you? What if that's the simple approach that we've been missing? That's, that's what Jesus says is the main thing. And so all of the rest of Jesus' teachings then, in terms of how we relate to each other, become an extension of this core teaching. Love your neighbor, love God. In loving your neighbor, who is created by God, we are also loving God. It's a simplicity that both of these commandments are mashed together into the single greatest commandment as Jesus tells it. So everything else then becomes a, an application. Everything else becomes an extension of this core teaching. Now, that means that the passages that we're going to look at this morning in Luke 17 take place within that broader context. What Jesus has been chasing throughout his ministry is a community that would love each other, a community that would love the people around them, not with the emotional feeling of love, although that's not a bad thing, but with the concrete action behind that love, right? Taking concrete responsibility for the needs, uh, for, the, uh, for the challenges that exist in the community around us. So now listen to Luke 17, to the first two verses. We're going to look at uh, two sayings, the first two verses, and then the next two verses after that. Jesus said to his disciples, occasions for stumbling are bound to come. Which, which I like this acknowledgement, right? Jesus isn't a fool, and it turns out that, that, that God's not standing looking down his nose at us, thumbing his nose at us, saying, this isn't so hard, guys. In fact, the opposite is taking place. Jesus is saying, God is telling us, I know that it is difficult. I know that, it, that, that, that occasions for stumbling or sinning, occasions for, for, for failing to be who God made you to be, those things are going to come. I love that acknowledgement, particularly as we're still only a few weeks removed from, from the Easter story in which Jesus doesn't avoid death. Jesus confronts death and defeats it. We see in, in this passage as well, there's an acknowledgement from Jesus and from God that occasions for somebody, that hard things are going to happen in life. That's part of what it means to be human. But, Jesus goes on, he says, but woe to anyone by whom they come. Right, woe, that also means calamity. I like translating it calamity a little bit better. Calamity to anyone by whom they come. In other words, for anybody who causes someone to stumble, right? Life is going to bring enough stumbling opportunities on its own. But for anyone who causes someone else to stumble, Jesus says, woe to you or calamity to you. When you have an opportunity, I'd encourage you to go back and look through the Gospels at the things that Jesus says, woe to, right? I think sometimes culturally we assume that Jesus is just yelling woe. He's yelling calamity at everything that exists around us, but it's not really true. When you go back and look at the statements where Jesus pronounces a woe, this prophetic lament, 
What we hear is Jesus is most often addressing one of three or four things. He's addressing uh, hypocrisy, right? He talks about, uh, you Pharisees are whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but death resides within. He's, he pronounces a woe over hypocrisy. He pronounces a woe over those who would shut off the door, who would close off the door to the kingdom of God. He pronounces a woe to those who miss the main thing. He says, look, you have, you've become so consumed with how much mint you're tithing or how many herbs you're tithing, but you haven't tithed justice. You haven't tithed mercy. You've missed the main things. Those are the kinds of things that Jesus pronounces woe over. And here we hear hear Jesus saying, woe to you who cause each other to stumble. These aren't small things that Jesus pronounces calamity over. They are significant things. They are things that keep us from being the people God made us to be, they are, they are things that keep us from, from living the life that God desires for all of his children. And then he doubles down on it in a way that makes us just, frankly, uncomfortable. He says, it'd be better for you if you're one of those who causes people to stumble. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Yikes. Jesus is not kidding around. This is a matter of life and death for Jesus. He's not simply suggesting, hey, watch out that you don't cause somebody to stumble by accident. Uh, He's not just suggesting that you don't do that. He is commanding it with language that's clearly hyperbole, but it's it's at least very clear. He says that if we're going to love our neighbor, we can't trip them along the way. Right? Part of loving our neighbor is making sure that we don't add to the challenges that life brings us as well. Now, the next passage it gets a little bit harder, frankly. Sometimes uh, the, in the messages that I've shared with you over the last couple of years, sometimes I've said a little too often, this is one of my favorite passages. I'm not saying that this week because this passage is so challenging. This isn't a passage that makes us feel warm and fuzzy on the inside. This is one of those challenges that's necessary. It's one of those passages that's necessary, but it challenges us emotionally and spiritually in ways that create discomfort. What I want to suggest to you is that that discomfort is okay. Right? In church, too often we seek comfort. We seek the the easy path forward. For today, let's be okay with the discomfort generated by this passage. Here's where Jesus goes next. He says, be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. Gosh, you must rebuke the offender. Now look, when we pluck these verses out of the larger context of Jesus' teachings, right? When we separate them from the main thing that Jesus tells us to do, love God, love neighbor, then it is awfully easy for us to misunderstand these verses and do one of two things. Either we'll misunderstand them and dismiss them, Right? It would be easy for us to say, we don't have to do, this language is old, this idea is old. We're not going to rebuke somebody who's doing something we disagree with, so we're going to dismiss the teaching when we separate it from the love that Jesus has been chasing for his entire ministry. Or the second thing that we're tempted to do is to misunderstand the verse and abuse it or use it to abuse others. In other words, some of us hear this passage, some of our brothers and sisters in the worldwide church have heard this passage that says, uh, if another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. They hear that verse and they use it to bludgeon people who are doing things that they disagree with. So how are we to make sense of this? Again, Jesus is not suggesting, hey, you might consider rebuking somebody who sins. He says, you must rebuke the offender. How are we to understand that? Here's what I want to suggest. There are times when in our Bible where we take the Greek and we, use the, we, we translate the Greek in such a way to capture the sense of what was being said. So here's what I mean by that. My translation says, if another disciple sins. That word disciple in Greek is actually brother. What I want to suggest to you is that we use the word disciple because it's gender neutral, because this is intended to speak not just to men, it's intended to speak to men and women. But when we change the translation from disciple 
or from brother to disciple, we lose something crucial. We lose the familial language. We, use, we lose the, the, the family language. What Jesus is saying is not, hey, if you see somebody on social media who's do, doing something wrong, you need to yell at them on social media. He's not saying, hey, if you get mad because some behavior exists in the community around you that you don't think God would like, don't go stand on the street corner and just yell into the universe. He's not saying, just go to every rally and just be angry when people are sinning. Jesus says, when you see a family member, right, somebody that you know, somebody that you have a relationship with, somebody who is part of your family, when you see a family member who's doing something that's leading them not toward God but away from God, what choice do we have? What choice do we have but to go to that family member, that brother or that sister, and say, hey, I can't watch you walk down this road. Hey, I, I cannot watch you hurt yourself or the people around you. Hey, the, the water into which you are wading is too deep for you. He says you must rebuke. And that rebuke is not intended to condemn. It's intended to redeem. It's not intended to, to, to condemn somebody and excommunicate them out of the community. It's intended to bring them back into the family. It's intended to protect them, right? And we can understand that in the larger context of Jesus' teachings because he says, again, love your neighbor and love your God. When we connect these verses to Jesus' larger teaching, we see the love that resides behind them. When we disconnect them from Jesus' teachings, then we drift into a harsh, judgmental, condemnation of the people around us. That's not where Jesus is driving. How do we know that? Just keep reading, right? He says, you must rebuke the offender. That's not the only thing that you must do. He says, be on your guard. If another disciple or another brother or sister sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there's repentance, you must forgive. I love the balancing effect. Right? If we must rebuke, or a rebuke that is born out of a sincere love, if we must rebuke, a rebuke that's intended to bring our family home, then we also must forgive. We cannot hold those things over the people around us. We cannot hold on to their brokenness. We must forgive is what Jesus said. It's a commandment. Right? Jesus offers a commandment, again, that is born out of love. Why must we forgive? because it's what love requires. It's the very thing that God has done for us, and that is what we do for the people around us. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. I love the balancing effect there. You know, the mayor said one more thing in the, in the book, uh, The Art of Neighbor, and the mayor says one more thing. He says, there is no distinction between the way that Christians neighbor to the people around them and the way that non-Christians neighbor to the people around them. Friends, that's an indictment for us. These verses that we've looked at, hey, hey, don't trip your brother or sister up. Hey, if your brother or sister has tripped up, call them back they can devolve into an uncaring, unloving, judgmental condemnation. But friends, that's not the way we're called to be. Friends, that's not the way that the people of God are called to engage when things are hard, when things mess up and are broken. In fact, it's to the contrary. The way that we neighbor ought to look vastly different than the world around us. The way that we neighbor ought to be shaped by the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen.